Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another session uh, in our anti-racism seminar series for classified professionals. My name is Susie Nitzel. I'm the Classified Senate President for Fresno City College and the District Office, and I'm also the Fresno City College Professional Development Coordinator. These seminars are part of a joint effort between Classified Senate, our Student Equity Office, and Fresno City College faculty to demonstrate our commitment to anti-racism and improve communication between classified professionals, faculty, students, and administrators. The session is being recorded and we will be reposting it on the professional development at Fresno City College YouTube page. Along, you can also find all the rest of our past seminars and future seminar recordings will be there also. So if you'd like to rewatch this session or any past sessions, you can find them there. If you have questions or comments throughout this presentation, please use the Q&A feature on the right side of the screen. You can make your questions anonymous. We understand that we're talking about some difficult issues and uh, we don't want you to feel hampered in any way. We want you to feel free to ask your questions because in order for us to really embrace anti-racism and move on in our equity work, we have to start having these difficult conversations. Please use the space also uh, to ask the uh, questions of the presenters. I will be moderating that Q&A, and as questions come up, I will interrupt our presenters um, to ask your questions. And with that, today we are joined a second time by both Matt Espinosa Watson and Victoria Benavides. Both are full-time faculty at Fresno City College and teach Chicano Latino studies out of the Ethnic Studies Department, and they are going to co-present on the topic of Latinx and Chicanx identity. The title of the presentation is The O, A, and X in Chicanx slash A slash O, the meaning of identity and issues impacting Chicanx Latinx communities. This will be a discussion on identity formation and socialization the history of evolution of terms like Chicano, Latinx, Mexican American, and more, and current issues impacting these communities. Victoria and Matt, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Um, I realize that I stopped sharing screen right when you're <laughs> reading our topic, so I'm gonna submit that request really quick. Thank you for having us. Matt, do you want to say anything about yourself since our slides do start with a little bit of a hello and intro? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been on just kind of by way of, of introduction and I, I think I know a lot of a lot of folks on our campus have been uh, teaching since 2005 at Fresno City, uh, full time since 2011. And, um, and just most recently have taken over as department chair within cultural and women's studies, which is being renamed right now into the department of uh, ethnic and gender studies. Um, and so those are a couple of things that are, I think, useful as far as introduction and uh, framing kind of where we are on campus also. And I'm Victoria Navarro Benavides. My pronouns are she, her, hers, or ella. And I have had the honor of joining um, CLS this year. This is my first academic year with the program and our Department of Ethnic and, Gen Ethnic and Gender Studies, which has been really exciting to be a part of as ethnic studies grows across California and hopefully more places. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and hop in um, to the presentation. So here's the agenda for our conversation. Um, and it's mostly as a, like a timekeeper for us and then also to make sure that we cover all of these topics uh, as promised by way of our description um, and the things that we're gonna go over like the goals. And I won't spend too much time there because Susie, you already read off kind of what our objectives are for our session. Um, so thank you for doing that. And then we are going to hop into ideas around identity formation and socialization processes, um, particularly theories or concepts that maybe don't feel like they matter in our everyday, but are actually um, created to describe the everyday experience of Chicanx and Latinx folks. Um, and then um, I'll hand off and Matt will help us go through a little more of like the history and the evolution of some terms that we see, right? So what 
are we? Do we call ourselves Hispanic? Where does that come from? Are we Mexican or Mexican American? Where does that come from? What does the X even mean and all of these terms now? Um, and so it'll be a great opportunity for us to kind of learn what has influenced that and maybe how to make more informed decisions about who we identify as if you identify as Latinx or um, if you are engaging with students and professionals who identify in that way. Um, and the last, we're gonna make a couple of comments around uh, current issues that are impacting Latinx communities, particularly around immigration, education, gender, and language. Here's the goal once more. I won't repeat it since it's been shared just now, but you can always look back to the slides for more details. So the conversation about Chicanx, Latinx identity formation and socialization, I think one of the really important pieces here is to just consider that um, there are tons of fields, areas of study that have deeply informed um, the idea of identity formation, the theories around identity as evolving. Um, we can probably lecture and or lead a conversation for many, many hours of showcasing how identity is informed and or captured in fields like education and law, history. Um, there's also counseling techniques that are specific to different ethnic and racial groups, right? And then you have a field like ethnic studies that is at its core um, dedicated to uh, and a birth out of a social movement um, to center communities of color um, and their experiential knowledge. And that has a whole other area of kind of ideas and concepts around identity formation. And then you have sociology and then art and expression, social work, psychology. All these fields have had something to say about identity development, um, identity formation, phases that we go through, stages that people go through and figuring out who they are how they identify. Um, and there's some central themes across all of these fields, um, but we're not going to cover all of the interpretations of identity. Um, we're just going to start touching kind of the surface of what identity has meant in regards to theories and concepts and history. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, please don't hesitate to, you know, search for some things or ask um, Matt and myself questions and we could lead you in the direction of further resources. Um, but well, let's hop into this conversation because I want to situate our talk um, really in ethnic studies, some counseling, sociology, psychology, and education. Um, a lot of concepts related to um, socialization are going to help us unpack what identity actually means. So if I start with kind of the ethnic studies, Shiganic studies perspective, a key person that comes to my mind when I think of identity is Gloria Anzaldúa. Um, her work is creative and theoretical, and some folks would say is not really about identity. Uh, it's more about history or it's more about gender. Um, but I think she has a lot to say about identity experiences and formation for folks who in particular have a connection to ancestors and relatives who are from Mexico. Um, and so her quote reads, a borderland is a vague and under, undetermined place created by the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. It is in a constant state of transition. The prohibited and forbidden are its inhabitants. Um, this idea of borderlands is not just the physical border she's referencing. She's also talking about this kind of psychological, spiritual, um, personal, intimate, philosophical border that so many Mexican, Mexican Americans, Chicanx folks live in. Um, and in many ways, this idea of in transition is a constant that comes out in research on identity formation for um, Chicanx populations. Um, and so we'll see this um, happening again as we move through some more of the academic conversations of this topic. So before we can talk about identity formation, um, particularly or in specific reference to Chicanx and Latinx communities, we have to talk about socialization. Um, and I wanted just to let the audience know that as we move through this part of the conversation, you can feel free to drop any questions you have for me in the chat 
or raise your hand, I don't mind asking in real time. And I think Matt would say the same thing um, as Susie mentioned, because we're about to unpack lots of different topics, right? And so the questions emerge. So please, please use the chat um, and engage in that way. So we're going to start with socialization and then they're going to wrap up with this section, this specific section on identity development. And there's a couple of models and approaches that I'll discuss. Um, we are all born into social identities, right? I don't know anybody who, before they were here on this side of Earth, said, I want to be born into the world as this gender, this race disability, right? It's not something that we have choice in. Um, but we are born into a world that has made very specific ideas of what it means to be a girl, or what it means to be a boy, or what it means to be Mexican, or what it means to be white, right? All of these ideas of what it means to perform those identities are social constructs, right? Um, race and ethnicity is a social construct. We as humans created it, we recreate it, we reinforce it over and over again by ways of interactions, laws and policies, larger systems that are at play, right? Um, it's not just the set of boxes that we click off on demographic surveys. While those represent something important, um, those are symbolic of larger systems categorizing us. Um, and we don't just check boxes. We live out, right, certain behaviors in many ways, right? Um, and so the socialization process is very strong. Uh, we get taught how to act like a girl or how to act like a Mexican or how to act like all these things, even if we're not saying it. There's all these different um, perspectives and expectations of how we move through the world. And I think it's important to acknowledge that because um, one of the key features of conversations around identity um, is that the world's influence definitely matters and um, also choice matters and agency matters, right? Um, Tatum, who is a scholar that looks at identity from a social justice lens, often says the question of who am I, um, the answer really depends in large part on who the world around me says I am. Um, and that seems very simple, um, but it's true, right? We often start learning what to call ourselves based on what others have called our, us. Um, and so I like to start the conversation on identity and acknowledging that socialization is a powerful experience and tool. So here is a kind of conceptual model of cycles of socialization. I know it's kind of blurry and unclear. I'll make sure that it's available to you all outside of this space. Uh, but ultimately what it's articulating is that we're really born into this world um, without any knowledge around issues of power or identity. Um, and we're kind of, as they always say, right, these sponges who kind of absorb and take in all these different things. Um, and sometimes what we don't always realize is that consciousness is not something we have, right, when we get here in the world, right? It's something that's built. We don't really have a sense of guilt. We don't really have a sense of responsibility. And then we start going through this kind of process where we're being taught about how you function, right, in your family, in your church, in your school, in your community. Um, and the socialization process often starts with the people you love most, um, and in this first kind of area of socialization, um, the people we love and trust are often teaching us the rules of how the world works, right? Um, and that's not usually malicious. It's usually like, let's make sure you're safe. Let's make sure you're okay. But in learning those things, we kind of get these mixed messages, particularly of how we have to act versus maybe something that we feel like we should act like. Um, and as you see in the cycle, it kind of keeps going on to talk about how as we continue to grow and develop, we're introduced into institutions and cultural expectations that really start telling us how to consciously make decisions, right? What colors to wear to make sure that it's clear to others, maybe what gender you are uh, or um, what language to use, right? When you're in front of certain people so that it's clear what background you come from. 
Um, and then there's this idea of enforcement that happens. It's like when you break the rules, there's usually somebody there to remind you, no, 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 this is not how it works. Girls do this, right? Or boys do that. And that um, those levels of enforcement kind of result in us even keeping this cycle of socialization on and on and going and going. Um, and this kind of last piece on the far um, left bottom of the cycle is just indicating that there are ways to kind of break out of um, perpetuating maybe norms um, that we have been taught about how identity should function, about how certain groups should move through the world. Um, and I'm happy to share more because there's a mirroring image of the cycle of socialization that's called the cycle of liberation. Um, and it's quite beautiful to see uh, what can happen and or what we can be a part of if we choose to say like, hey, some of the messages about my race and gender that I was taught to embody aren't really who I am, right? And so how do you kind of break that cycle? Um, I have another image of it and it's more in color. Um, one of the things that I like to show uh, in this image is that it kind of simplifies things a little bit um, and it highlights that this cycle is about born pre-existing without any kind of ideas of power or oppression. Then we get socialized, right? And then we get, um, reinforced and bombarded with messages. And I like how it highlights some key institutions like church or school. Um, and then there's things like culture, song lyrics that tell us how to act, right? All these kinds of things. Um, and then it also says a little bit about how it's enforced, how we're told and held accountable to keeping these rules of race alive or gender alive or sexuality alive. Um, and one of the key factors in this colored image is the core. So it particularly talks about how in many ways socialization maintains itself because many people are scared, right, to change what they've always known, or they're ignorant to the idea that maybe there are other ways that you can act or be and still be true to your ethnic self or your gendered self. Um, there's confusion or insecurity. Um, and so I offered both of these because I thought it was a really helpful um, tool to see how an organization is kind of interpreting how we can engage in understanding the cycle. So I want us to kind of take this idea of just saying race is something that human beings construct in, right? We reconstruct it and keep it alive every day. So Racism is something that we constructed. It's something that we keep alive and reinforce every day. Right? We have all these things embedded in us, whether it's consciously or subconsciously or non-consciously, um, these biases and also these very clear markers of racism. Right? Um, and that's true for so many folks. Um, and if we acknowledge that we're a part of creating that, and I think we're one step closer to acknowledging that we could actually be a part of addressing it, right? And creating more creative liberatory solutions to what we have made. Um, and so if we start there, then we can enter a conversation, particularly about Chicanx, like the next issues from a different place of uh, being more open to hearing and seeing how identity is playing out, right? With this community. And so I offer some questions because we're going to watch a quick film um, and I encourage you to use these questions to reflect on, reflect with, um, as we're watching the film together. I was kind of in tour in the way. Uh, I wanted to dress like my friends in America. I wanted to talk like them. I wanted to be like them, listen to the same music. I started listening to country music. I think the Latino I identity is pretty confusing to me. Uh, because uh, oftentimes I find it in a little checkbox on a form and, and I'm confused on whether I should put Latino or Hispanic, but I'm Mexican. As Latin Americans, as Hispanics in the U.S., um, there's, there's a community get, that gets built regardless of which specific country you're coming from. In our history is a history of African people, indigenous people, Europeans, conquistadores, all these different people colliding, many times not with their consent. So that informs all these loaded issues people have. It's like navigating three identities. You're, if you're from the States, you're American. 
you're black and you're Latina. And furthermore, wherever country that you identify in coming from. And that's, those are, that's a lot to navigate. But at this point in my life, I actually don't identify as Guatemalan. And it's something that I guess a lot of like young immigrants sort of feel where there's this saying like, ni da aquí, ni da allá. Not from there, not from here. In trying to blend in with the culture in America, I gave up a lot of uh, what I grew up with. Maybe I saw it as something that was kind of shameful or in the way. Uh, I wanted to dress like my friends in America. I wanted to talk like them. I wanted to be like them, listen to the same music. I started listening to country music. I got all these crazy questions like, did you come here in a canoe? And do you know what snow is? And do you live in a hut in Puerto Rico? I thought my name was Spick until I was about 13. And that was my first uh, awareness that uh, race was an issue. People say, oh, you look like a white dude. In some contexts, not in all contexts, depends where I am, depends who I'm with, depends a lot, whole lot of things. Um, depends what language I'm speaking, but however I look, when I leave my name, I can't get a phone call back about an apartment in New York City. And this isn't like 10 places I call, this is like 30. And I remember telling a kid one time, I was like, let me tell you, the Ku Klux Klan comes here and they see your last name, you're going too, bro. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and the kids are like, what are you talking about? And it was like a big thing. People generally, you know, unless I speak Spanish, um, you know, people assume right away, I mean, that I'm African American, that I'm black, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, just one of those things. It may be the deep voice, it may be the color of my skin. Because I talk white, I'm not Dominican, or I'm not black, or I'm not Afro-Latina, or whoever people perceive me as of being. Um, And that hurt, and that still hurts. <laughs> because one of my daughters is lighter than the other, they had blackness issues. And I remember my oldest daughter telling my youngest daughter that she was black, and that her hair, she said something. And I remember crying, like, immediately, like, oh, my God. No. No, no, and I had to sit them down and talk to them about our roots and that everything that they learned from the family was wrong. I feel like I wanted more, more of my culture. You know, I grew up, there was a point I stopped speaking Spanish to her and I still don't speak to her in Spanish. So I feel like something was lost and I don't know if it was just because she was busy raising five kids and didn't really think about culture in that way and how I would come to identify myself. Growing up, you know, like this, as you know, as a, as a young, young teenager, I told people I was Puerto Rican, which is completely, you know, which is right. But at a particular point when I became a little more politicized, I was definitely more of a black nationalist that I was a Puerto Rican nationalist. Maybe because the concept of black nationalism and the black liberation movement is so much more accessible. There isn't a language issue. So yeah, I, I totally was reading Malcolm and Marcus and James Baldwin and Huey Newton before I read any of the Puerto Rican nationalists. Either you're black or you're white. And, and if you're like kind of in the middle, you kind of like don't want to be in the middle. You want to, a lot of us want to be white. But we're still brown, we're still color, you know, we still have color, you know, we're still, according to what race, what the institution is telling us, what race is based on your skin color. So you're like, I'm brown. So that's kind of like where it came. Like, I'm not, I, I, I'm not black and I'm not white and I don't want to be white. So I'm, I'm kind of brown and this is kind of like a thing that's there. If, if you are closer to being white, you are supreme. If you are not, you are less than. And to me, that's how I've understood it. And that's why I think it's very important that Latinos who look like me say, you, you identify as Latino, cool, Colombiano, cool, whatever else, but you benefit from light skin privilege. Uh, you, the fact that you have ojos claros, people wanna fetishize that, understand what that means. However much I might wanna say, oh, oh, oh my gosh, I'm so special because I have green eyes. You, you're, you're perpetuating white, white supremacy by, by running with that. I'll talk to a young girl, a young teenager, and she'll say, you know, I'm not white enough to fit into mainstream society. I'm not black American enough to fit in in that, in, you know, in, in that um, faction of society. 
And I'm like, but you know what? You're the best person to be kind of like a connector between both because in you is everything. And being Latino in an American kind of new world way is basically being a physical embodiment of how America began as we know it. So you're every woman. So for me, being Latino is being phenomenal. So here are our questions again, right? Um, and I'll pause so that we can see if there's any responses or thoughts on it. Um, first one says, what factors are influencing how these Latinx um, see or understand themselves? How does the white black binary of race impact this conversation? And, and there I'm talking particularly about how folks have said like, right, in America, there's only white and there's only black. And what are you if you're not either of those things? That's what I mean by the black white binary. And then where do you feel or see passion or emotion kind of evoked in this video, right, by folks? So I'll let those sit there and see if we have any thoughts. Victoria, we're going to give it a second because there is a delay between yeah. live and the actual stream. So I want to give our attendees a chance to catch up to us. So please, if you have any questions or or you want to, uh, to respond to Victoria's prompts about the film that we just watched. It doesn't have to be in the Q&A. Please put your thoughts in the chat. I'm not seeing anything, Victoria, but if anything comes up, I will interrupt you. Sounds good. Any thoughts from my co-presenter here, since we, we can do that? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that was, I've, you know, it's a really powerful video. I think it's something that I might, you know, start using uh, within within my class contexts as well. I think it, you know, it, there's so much to, to unpack there. And I'm hoping we get to, again, have some more conversation about all of it, because there's so much of, of this, you know, um, the, the white privilege within within this, the black white binary pieces to talk about the in, how embedded that was, you know, this is in history. I loved the the ending, right? That that last statement of to be Latina is being a physical embodiment of how America was created, right? You, you know, uh, you are every woman. Um, that was and so that that particular piece. I just like that really really um, hit me in terms of again thinking about that history and the layering of this identity. So. Um, just, uh, you know, I was inspired by it. Thanks for sharing. It. Yeah, that last quote is um, something that I like felt a sense of pride around and then also a sense of sadness at the same time, because like it tells a, a lot right about what that narrative may mean then that each of us have. Um, but I hope folks can engage the video and ask some questions as they see because it is it offers a lot of thinking and probing for more. Um, let me hop on to the next slide. Um, so some of the pieces that I want to highlight um, across different disciplines that talk about identity development um, have really saw some patterns, basically, in how folks are choosing to identify within the Chicanx or Latinx community. In particular, I chose to highlight factors of influence on Chicanx identity, Chicana, Chicano identity, um, and these are some areas that people have researched and studied. And so, you know, what we call ourselves is um, a powerful thing, but it goes and moves beyond kind of identity politics. Um, even though that's not a bad word in my vocabulary, it also goes beyond um, being politically correct. There is actually like so much emotional embodiment and um, spiritual cultural elements that go into how people choose to identify or not to identify. And so some of the factors that folks have been able to extract as patterns when engaging in empirical research, meaning with folks who are alive and looking at documents from the past, are things like external factors. So uh, environmental realities of where you work, what the workplace environment is like, deeply impacts how you see yourself as Chicanx um, or not. Your school, where you grew up, right? Your family or your caregivers, um, church, 
kind of transnational experiences? Do you live on the border of US and Mexico? Did you live in Mexico? Did you live in Guatemala? Did you live in Latin America for some time? Did you migrate, right? Do you move between borders, uh, literally crossing it to go to work, right? Those types of things influence how somebody identifies. Then you have things like political climate. So it could be specific to your area or your place of engagement. Those tend to have a stronger hold and influence then on how you, what you call yourself. But as we know in the last, uh, I was gonna say last eight years, but I feel like this is true for so many more years than that. Um, there is a deep tension around migration that has been directed at folks either from Mexico or Central America. And those are political climate issues that impact how folks view themselves, what they say about themselves, how they identify. Then you have things like life changes, right? So marriage and divorce, um, experiences with discrimination, those being markers for somebody on what they'll call themselves or how they pronounce their name. Um, attending college is another key um, factor in how folks start identifying. Um, desegregation policies, uh, whether they are formal or informal, right, um, are also life changes that have happened. Then you have kind of day-to-day -day encounters that folks are tracing. So encounters with race or ethnicity stigmas or stereotypes, right? Um, how do those impact then you'll be willing to say you are, right? Um, and then other concepts that are key in this literature, no matter what field really that you're talking about is ethnicity, and is being Chicanx or Latinx an ethnicity or is it a race, right? Um, and I know Matt is gonna talk more about that. Um, another concept is acculturation and assimilation. These are two key concepts that keep emerging no matter what perspective you take because they are so salient in the experience of Chicanx people. So in closing of my part, um, I wanted to highlight some different models that are exploring uh, identity development for Chicanx uh, folks. Um, all of these models have been applied broadly to Latinx folks, but um, this one, Ruiz is, was looking particularly at Mexican-American youth. Um, and uh, there's basically a linear element to her idea of identity. Um, so in many ways, it's this kind of understanding who you are in the world for this causal stage, becoming aware of it in the cognitive stage, realizing that there's consequences to who you are as a Mexicano or a Mexican American, um, working through what those consequences have meant for you, if you're willing to take risks, if you're not, and who you are, what you identify in, and then kind of resolving those kind of identity crises within yourself. Uh, the critique of this approach has been that it, identity is not linear, right? That we do not kind of go from stage one to stage two. Um, that in many ways, we're like constantly moving through these stages. Um, and this is from a lens that's looking at how to treat and counsel folks from a multicultural perspective, right? So then you have other folks who are looking at the intersections of higher education and psychology, and they're looking at identity, particularly as an orientation, like a perspective, a worldview, and not as linear stages, right? Um, it's a process. It's a developmental process. Um, it doesn't go from A, B to C. It might go from A to C to F back to A. Um, or you might exist in multiple parts of that at the same time. And so as you can see from this um, short table, uh, it's particularly focused on identifying how folks feel um, and how they orient themselves. So let me give you an example. For the first one under orientation, it says Latino integrated, and this is considered kind of a wide lens of understanding of self. Um, and then it says identify as or prefer. Well, somebody who might be in the orientation of Latino integrated uh, might consider themselves an individual um, in a group context, right? They may really do identify as Latino. They see it positively, right? They also see whiteness as really complex and not as easy to experience or understand. Um, and they see race as something that's dynamic. It's contextual, right? Depends on what room you're in, who you're with, and 
what kind of um, person is in charge or of sorts. Um, and they also are well aware that race is something that's been constructed and is reconstructed every day. Right? Whereas if you go down kind of in these orientations, you'll see that other folks might move through the world differently. So you'll have Latinx identified folks who are more white identified, right? Uh, and they see the lens very much as like, I would prefer to be called white. Being called Latino is a negative thing. Whiteness is considered a very positive thing. And they may frame race more as a white black binary. There's this either or experience. Um, and so they're very invested in proximity to whiteness, right? Um, and so um, this model really kind of offers a more complex understanding how people can orient themselves. Um, and I just want to assure you all that not everybody is in a single orientation at once, right, based on this idea. The other part that is deeply important to myself and so many who teach in ethnic studies is really the role of ethnic studies and then Chicanx studies and um, really unpacking the fact that identity is complicated, right? Um, legally, there's this concept of us, Latinx folks, Chicanx folks as white, yet socially we're positioned in this non-white second class citizenship area in society, right? And that is true for how folks are treated, um, how folks are kind of ranking in different kind of statuses and different systems. Uh, and we'll unpack this more because I think that even if legally, um, Hispanic, Latinx, Chicanx folks are considered white. That doesn't mean the implications of our culture and our ethnicity have resulted in us benefiting in the same ways that white communities have. Um, and so I think ethnic studies is really pushed for us to reconsider how history matters, how policy matters, um, and how so many other things really have mattered to the construction of the Mexican identity, right? Um, and so I, I won't um, share too much about theory, but two takeaways from this part that I wanted to end with is, you know, why does this matter? Well, I think identity is in constant construction. It's being deconstructed, reconstructed all the time. Um, and so as folks who are wanting to learn and engage in more anti-racist practices, and I encourage you to do that. And to know that identity is one of those things that you can keep learning about, right? Because so many folks are changing over time and developing over time. Um, and that's the same for this whole conversation about Chicanx communities. The other takeaway is why does this matter, right? Another reason is that there is actual research that exists, experiences, policy systems, relationships, and interactions, they matter. And there's research out there that is documenting the ways in which folks are choosing to identify, right? Um, when did I choose to be call myself Chicana versus Hispanic? That matters. Um, and it doesn't just matter so that you can sell me a product <laughs> or um, trace my feeds on Etsy and Instagram, right? It matters because there's something to say about choice and decision and alignment with either my ideals or uh, what, how I want to move through the world. Um, and there's tons of research that is trying to trace those cognitive and subconscious decisions so that we can better understand and articulate the stories and narratives of Chicanx communities. I'm going to hand over to Matt because he's going to take over the next series of slides. Um, but we are excited to see if you all have questions as we move along. Awesome. Thank you so much, Victoria. I, um, you know, I want to, I want to start with a, a question that you asked in a hypothetical sense, and we, maybe we can come back to it because we don't need to address it right now, but that, that question of when did you start calling yourself a Chicana? Right? Like, I, I think that would be, anyway, that's, that's one of my questions for, for maybe at the end. So, um, uh, thank you so much. You gave, I think you just you you um, gave us such a rich setting here for understanding identity formation, not just again within Latinx communities, but more broadly speaking, and yet also so much that is you know very specific to Latinx communities. So I I, I again I'm uh, inspired uh, by by what you've shared so far, and so again I so I want to get into a little bit again about the history of of these terms. Um, and kind of just talk about looking at the chronology um, over the last uh, the last century or so. So um, 
so we can go, I guess, go ahead to the, to the next slide. The, um, let's see, let me make sure we're on. So I, I started off with a quote um, that I actually had to search for. I hadn't used it in my um, in class in a while, um, but it was in an old PowerPoint. And, and I found it in, from uh, an author named Jose Antonio Burciaga, who was a, a comedian, um, an essayist, and a performer. Um, and it says, Chicano is a better choice than Hispanic. For Mexicanos, it makes more sense than Hispanic, a term too generic and European for a people that are more indigenous in appearance and culture. So I wanted to start there just with an idea by somebody who clearly liked the term Chicano. Um, and, and so we're gonna talk more about, you know, the those two terms, um, a little bit on that, right? But um, but I, I wanted to give you a sense of why these terms matter to some people. And, and again, I also love, Victoria, you giving us toward the end right now that, that why does it matter, right? I think that's, a, that's an important question to, to ask. Um, in, in situations like this. Um, so let's see, moving, moving on, I wanted to, to give a sense of, of, without giving us too much depth here um, or, or too much history, to try to give us a sense of just like the chronology evolution of some of these terms, right? And so I wanted to start off by looking at the fact that, you know, the, the 19th century, right? Um, let's go back to the 1800s for a second. Um, to understand that, you know, the terms that you could you could use as a Mexican person or a person of Mexican descent living in what becomes the United States, right? What in the in in the 1800s transitioned from being part of the Spanish Empire to being part of the newly um, formed Mexican government to then becoming U.S. territory. Um, the the terms available for folks were the main one that would be used in any setting was was Mexican in, in at least in English right in Spanish that same term you would say um, that somebody is Mexicana or Mexicano depending on gender and and within the Spanish language um, you know words are gendered and if it ends in an A it is a feminine um, and if it ends in O it is masculine or if it ends in O it's also the universal. That's the way the Spanish language works. It's important to talking about um, some of the things we'll, we'll get into in a second. So in, in the, you know, again, from the, from the 1800s to the present, because some people today will, will use the term Mexican or again, Mexicano, Mexicana, right? And so I'll talk a sec in a sec about a little bit about what these terms mean, but I wanted to just give us a sense. Um, within again, the territories that would become the United States, there's also very much regional identities that developed in the 17 and 1800s and that um, continue on as well to the present, right? So Tejano identity is something that I'm you know, familiar with um, in terms of having family from Texas, right? But the idea of um, uh, these these territories that at the time um, were so far away from, you know, Mexico City and the center of, of kind of government and power in Mexico, that they were um, very much developing their own regional identities very far away from, again, Mexico City or Guadalajara or the big cities at the time. So, um, so those are regional identities, I would say, that, that fit into that 19th century framework. Um, as we look at the 20th century, we have a lot of terms, obviously, and I've, uh, the majority of these fit into the 20th century framework, and we'll talk about them. And I, I tried to kind of give you a sense of the order they appeared in, um, right? And so as we look at the early 20th century, it is in the 1920s and 30s that we see the term Mexican-American start popping up in literature, in newspapers, in clubs and associations. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's really those, I would say the 1930s is the, is the time period most associated with the beginning of the term Mexican-American. Um, at the same time in the early 20th century, somebody who was of Mexican descent in you living in LA or living in Fresno, right? Um, might also identify as Latin American. Right? That was um, kind of the broad identity that, that they might identify with at the time. At the time, um, there's a very well-known group in, important within civil rights history called the League of United Latin American Citizens or LULAC. Um, that was an important group that was mostly Mexican Americans who were involved in, you know, in, in the, um, the advocacy within that group. Right. And so Mexican American and Latin American are both kind of early 20th century um, uh, and and continue on. Right. And so and then it's really the, you know, the 1950s 
although it is the 60s that is the decade most associated with the idea of Chicano or Chicana. Um, and just to kind of complete the, the list here in terms of chronology, um, Hispanic 1970s and 80s. Um, 1980 is the first census where Hispanic is a, is a category, right? It, um, it comes about in the 70s in, in, um, in government offices in Washington, D.C. Um, and, but it's 1980 that it kind of becomes official. Latina and Latino become popular terms in, I would say also, again, that same framework, the 1980s, really, 1970s and 80s, you start seeing those, those terms more often. And again, Latina, in this case, would be the feminine and Latino, the, the masculine or the general term for everyone. Um, and so that's going to, again, take us into the 21st century. Chicano or Latino with a, what, what is that called? Um, with the at sign. How about that? With the at sign. Um, was a 1990s thing, and it was really meant to not put a slash, I guess, or to not write out Chicano and Chicana, um, but it was meant as an inclusivity thing, right? It was, so that at symbol in terms of Chicana or Latina, that's how I've heard people pronounce it like that back in the 90s, was, an, was kind of um, getting us toward, in a sense, the 21st century and, and the X's we're, we're to look at here. The last one that I think of in terms of the 20th century um, is also associated for me with the 1990s. Um, and that's the idea of Chicano or Chicana spelled with an X at the beginning, right? Um, Chicano or Chicana. And, and then so 21st century terms, right? Um, in, again, in my attempt to think about it in the order that I heard about them and the order that I started seeing them kind of appearing in, in media and um, uh, academia and social media and otherwise um latinx right and then chicanx and then the most recent variations i think that fit within this 21st century framework are latin or latine um and so i again i wanted to first give us this kind of overview and think about the idea of kind of like where where these fit along the map um again just because we can go all the way back to the 1800s and find the term mexican Right. It doesn't mean that in 2022 we don't have a lot of people using that. Right. So um, I want to make sure to be clear about that. Not all of you know, some of these terms feel more stuck in time than others. And, and we'll address that here. Um, so I think we can move on to the next because I want to get into a little bit more of like the, the, the definitions. Right. And so so what I, I always start off this conversation, um, especially within a you know, classroom setting, thinking about the, the fact that when people of Mexican ancestry in the United States are asked how they identify and they're, they're given a blank um, rather than a, a, a list of choices. When they're given a blank, people of Mexican descent in the U.S. most often identify as Mexican. Right? Um, and this is, this is pretty steady, at least in, in surveys and in, in studies I've seen and over you know, the past it's 20, 25 years. Um, so people of Mexican descent often identify as Mexican. And what I, what I, I think is, think is really important to explore um, here or in a classroom setting, right, is, is this idea that the term Mexican, as simple as it seems, really has, has two definitions. And it's important to know that sometimes people are using one or the other. Right. And so the first one I say is, is I often talk about it as kind of like the dictionary definition or the textbook definition, um, because it is most likely what you're going to find if you look it up in, in either of those things. Um, and what that definition tells us is that a Mexican is somebody who's born in the nation of Mexico. Right. It's, it's, it's a discussion in that case of nationality, where what nation you were born in. Right. Um, and so. When you know, I bring that up in a classroom setting of, with a class of, of mainly people of Mexican descent, um, and say that's the definition, I always get some like raised eyebrows or quizzical looks, and like, and is that it though? Because because the way we use it in everyday life here in the United States, here in the Central Valley, um, is is very often to talk about our ethnicity, not our nationality, right? Um, and, and so Mexican is very often used to, to be kind of shorthand for saying I'm of Mexican descent or Mexican ancestry, right? And that is, um, 
I guess I want to I, I share as I'm sharing that piece that that's the one, you know, that's what I learned I was growing up by, you know, my mom. My, my mom told me that I was Mexican, despite the fact that I knew I was also half white, despite the fact that I knew I was born in Fresno. She was, you know, no, you're a Mexican. And that's just what that's. And so, you know, to, to be very clear, she was she wasn't telling me that I was born somewhere else. She was telling me that that was my ethnicity. That was who I was. Right? And that's the way that a lot of us use it in day to day life. Um, I would say sometimes those of us who are Mexican-Americans and born and raised in this country, um, sometimes we might get into what, what was the word Victoria used or the phrase you used? Um, in, oh, enforcement, the idea of enforcement, right? Like we might, we might have um, somebody enforce that first definition on us and say, hold on, so where were you born? Especially oftentimes, um, you know, somebody who was born in Mexico and who identifies as soy Mexicano or soy Mexicana. That's where I'm from. And, um, and so sometimes you might have this tension between Mexican immigrants saying, no, 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 you're, hold on, who, where were you born? You're telling me you're a Mexican, like the country I'm from? So uh, again, just kind of thinking about those, like the borderlands and the enforcement aspect of things, right? Um, just, just as simple as a term as Mexican can, can kind of have all these, these different layers. So um, the, the, you know, the chronology I kind of kept along here, but I say Mexican American as that term comes around in the um, 30s and, and that that time period of the early 20th century. What that term is, is really a it's um, I think it's a straightforward one. Right. So people of Mexican descent or ancestry generally who were born or raised in the United States started using this term. Right. And embracing this identity in the 1930s and 40s, especially this idea of a Mexican American identity. And I say below the original connotations, because I don't think that those original connotations are um, are necessarily part of, of the, the feel of the term today in 2022. I think in 2022, Mexican American to most people it sounds like a, just a descriptor of I'm a Mexican and I'm from America. It's it seem it's it's kind of neutral, I would say, in, in my experience of it. But original connotations, as we look to the, the 1930s and 40s, is that, that there's really this, this time period of, um, well, for one, the massive roundup and deportation of Mexican and Mexican-Americans as a response to the Great Depression, right? In the 1930s, there is this, um, that's, I think, just one thing to kind of highlight maybe in terms of the 1930s as a decade and, and connecting it to this term and to this idea really of, to embrace Mexican-American identity in the early 20th century was to also kind of embrace this idea of being American and really embrace the idea of, of assimilation into American society, right? Um, the majority of, of uh, Mexicans in the U.S. at that point in time in the early 20th century were recent migrants from Mexico. The major not all, but the majority were. Right and um, and had come to the U.S. for opportunities, right, and wanted their children to have those opportunities, not to be sent to the Mexican school down the street that was a barn that wasn't the same as the white school, right? They wanted their kids to have those same opportunities. So they so that 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 generation that is often talked about within the literature of academic literature of Chicana Chicano studies, it, the Mexican American generation is really the 30s through the 50s. Um, and this highlighting of this idea of really wanting to, to fit into American society and, and, and be accepted by American society. Um, and the reason I, I include this third term, especially on this slide, is I think it's, it's helpful as a contrast because the definition is kind of exactly the same as Mexican-American, people of Mexican descent or ancestry, generally born and raised in the U.S., but the term Chicano and Chicana come around in the 1960s and young people start using it as that has, again, I would say these very heavy connotations at that time, especially what it means over the decades is, is its own story. But the, the 1960s to say you were Chicano or Chicana meant that you meant that you were a Mexican-American, but, but a Mexican-American who wanted to emphasize really the rejection of Anglo-American society and Anglo-American acceptance um, and who wanted to be accepted on their own terms. And, and it was in, in so many ways, as we think about some of the stuff that Victoria shared earlier about you know, socialization and our parents and seeing the world around us, right? Um, 
the 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 overwhelming sense I've gotten from the elders I've spoken with and the and you know the books I've read as well, but is that you know to to call yourself Chicano or Chicana in the '60s um, was um, was to say like I saw my parents' generation you know bend over backward to try to be American and still not be accepted as American, and we're not going to do that. We're going to just do our own thing, and we're going to kind of demand acceptance as we are, as we are now. Um, and so there was, there was very much a, um, an ethnic pride. This is part of, again, um, you know, the 60s and civil rights and nationalist movements. And, you know, um, um, so it's within that context very much, right? And so um, let's go into the next slide and some of the, some of the more, I think, general terms that are going to be useful and against the ones used in our society on a, in, in the, um, excuse me, different places. So Hispanic, Matt, yes. Matt, it's Susie. We have, we have a question. Uh, sure, sure. sure. Let's Do you it. notice any change of usage depending on the generation into which the individual was born? I mean, by the individual, him or herself. Um, yeah, totally, totally. Um, you know, I don't, I didn't want to get into the, like, kind of get into the, the weeds of Chicano, Chicana, because that, that could be its own hour long conversation that you didn't sign up for today. Um, but, but, you know, that term seems to start off in that Mexican American generation in the, in the thirties and forties, it's an insult to make fun of people's accent who are like native people from central Mexico who, when they got to the U.S., were working in agricultural jobs with other Mexican-Americans and called themselves Mexicanos because it has to do with the native language they speak or spoke, which was the language of the Aztecs going back into thousands of years of history. So these native people, native men and women from central Mexico, found themselves being discriminated against by other Mexicans or Mexican-Americans here in the U.S., and the term Chicano or Chicana, which was more of an SH than a CH in those earliest generation or its earliest iteration, um, was an insult to say that basically um, was, was a way of saying, calling somebody basically um, kind of like a dumb Indian, a dumb Indio. Indio is a term within Spanish, but like that, that certainly fits. This idea that like Chicano and Chicana in the 40s and 50s was an insult. And in the 60s and 70s is a term of pride. And to my students in the 21st century, they, you know, there's, I don't know, five to 10% of them that come into a, my class knowing the term. Um, and a smaller percent who identify with the term coming into my classes. And I would say that the general sense, most my students have today is that Chicano is either something connected to activism or to lowriders and and like urban gang and lowrider and and like that's the impression today. So I would say totally, it totally it, um, changes with with each generation, right? And that um, that again, Chicano is a is a good one to use in that sense. It seems like it starts off as an insult. The, the insult is like flipped by the youth in the 60s who want to, um, who instead of it being a term to insult people for being indigenous or native and having those roots, it's an embracing of those roots, right? And so it's an attempt to kind of flip, flip the whole idea of it. So, uh, yeah, so I think, again, uh, that part to me is fascinating and I'd love to discuss more, right? Because it's, uh, yeah, the way people identify with those terms changes, certainly. Um, and, and over the generations. Hey, thank you for the question. And again, look forward maybe to talking about it more. Um, in, in terms of, again, just the, the basic definitions, though, I would say at, at least the, the, the left two there, Hispanic and Latina, Latino, um, are, are the general terms that could be used for people who might be Mexican-American, but also for a lot of other people, too. Right, so most of the terms I've focused on up until this point were about Mexican people and Mexican Americans. Um, Hispanic, again, as I said, comes around in um, the 70s and 80s, and it is a government term. It really is um, one of the only terms here that has a legal definition um, within U.S. law because it's a U.S. you know government term. 
And it means that you are from a country where Spanish is the main language, or you're descended from people who are from a country where Spanish is the main language. Right? So it's, um, again, you don't have to be from there. You don't have to be Spanish, or excuse me, you don't have to speak Spanish to be considered Hispanic. Um, but from a country where it's the dominant or primary language. There is a whole lot of overlap between the category Hispanic and the term Latina or Latino. Um, and I'll show us a slide. I think it's the next one that will help with that a little bit. But Latina or Latino is, in, in many ways, it's a, you know, it's a um, shortening of the term in Spanish, Latino Americano, right? But it is, um, it's in it, people from Latin America, right? And people from there and their descendants. So again, um, if you have a grandparent from Puerto Rico, then yes, you're Latina or Latino. You did it, if, do you want to embrace that or use that term? That's up to you, right? But if, if all of your grandparents are from Mexico or Latin America somewhere, then yes, certainly you are Latina, Latino. Do you want to use that? That's again, that's up to you. Um, and so the, the last um, one I'm going to just share with us here is, is giving us a variation on. Um, and the variation is, is, as I said, what something I came across in the 1990s. But the variation of, of spelling here of Chicano Chicana was really meant to emphasize uh, the indigenous roots of the term itself as a kind of the pronunciation thing I just shared with you all and the indigenous roots of the people embracing it also. The idea of being um, uh, that, that the X and the embracing of that X had to do um, with a, a certain political statement about your connection to native or indigenous people in the Americas. And so I saw that in, um, um, in print in the, in, again in the 1990s, um, Roberto Rodriguez and Patricia Gonzalez, who are professors at University of Arizona, um, were writing about it actually in a thing called the Column of the Americas, which used to come out in the Fresno Bee um, until it got like, they complained about it and got removed for being too radical for the Fresno Bee. Um, but I, it planted a lot of seeds for me, at least. <laughs> these, these two professors who are now at University of Arizona, um, they talked about Chicano with an X. Ana Castillo is another famous, um, well-known Chicana feminist writer who in the 1990s was using that, that X at the front of the term, right? To really, again, emphasize that aspect of, of um, indigenous pride. Um, so I think I have uh, just a couple, a little bit more on the history and evolution, and then we'll go back, back, back out again. So this I felt like might be useful just to think about Latin America, because for um, so many of us, it's not a region often highlighted in our school settings. Um, and, um, and so unless you are specifically getting into Latin American studies, or maybe you had a Spanish instructor somewhere along the line who talked more about culture and history and geography, um, but anyway, I wanted to just make sure we know what Latin America is. And so it's really, you know, when we say somebody is Latino or Latina or Latinx, what we're talking about this connection to somewhere on this map here. And so it's, it's a big map, right? It's, it's um, it, Mexico, which is part of North America, the North American continent, something weird. Mexico often gets thrown into South America when it's not even in Central America. Um, you know, Canada, the U.S. and Mexico are North America. Um, and then all these nations within Central and South America and the Caribbean are also part of Latin America. Um, so let's see. I think the next one is, is just a little bit of a, you know, a slide. I, know it might, I don't know how, how well you can see it here, um, but I, I borrowed that from HuffPost from several years ago. And it's just a, another guideline on the Latino-Hispanic divide, basically. The, the idea that Latino is a term telling you about geography. Where in the world is this person from? Oh, they're from, or their family's from Latin America. Hispanic is a term telling you about language. Are they from a Spanish-speaking place, right? Um, and, and so we get the main, um, the main kind of like exceptions to the rules are um, Spaniards from Spain are from Spanish-speaking countries, right? That's, the, that's where their, that language came, came from. Um, so they are Hispanic. Right? So a Spaniard from Madrid, España, is a Hispanic within the United States. But they are not a Latino or a Latina. Right? They're not from Latin America. They're from Europe. 
Um, and on the other hand, right, we have um, Brazilians who are certainly Latino or Latina. Um, they're from Latin America, but they're not Hispanics. They're not from a country where Spanish is the dominant language. They're, Brazil speaks Portuguese. So those are the really two exceptions. Other than that, in general, Latina, Latino, Hispanic, we're talking about the same you know, groups of people, a large group of, of lots of different people. So um, let's, I think we can move on. I, I don't feel like I really have time, I think, to get into, but I wanted to share the idea that the Pew Research Center, the PEW um, Pew Research Center, has just a history of doing fantastic work. Um, and if you are interested in kind of just exploring the idea here of the Latinx, the Hispanic population in the US, and what do they think about this? And what do they, what religion are they? And how many of them speak Spanish? And the Pew PEW Research Center has, has so much to offer, right? And so they do this, um, this big report every so often. And that's what I think this 2017 is the last, the last big one with uh, looking at the, the population of, of about 60 million um, individuals within the US who identify as, or who are classified as Hispanic. Um, so let's let's move into the the piece that's going to kind of hopefully take us into the 21st century um, a little bit more, and and this is oh whoops yeah that's and that that should be where all end though is is in that realm there so um, so Latinx I want I'm I'm hoping we're going to get the, the chance to talk much more about and and get um, Victoria to to weigh in on as well um, but you know really that it's it's a variation of the term Latina or Latino. Um, it is, for me, something I identify again with the early 21st century um, and seeing online before I ever heard anybody say it and saw, saw it in online formats. Um, the idea is that it's meant to be inclusive and it's meant to be gender neutral in that way that I said again that Spanish is a gendered language. So everything ends with an O or an A to be masculine or feminine. Um, uh, and the X is meant to, you know, to replace that and to be, um, to be neutral. Um, I think it's important and, and, and probably, I think, obvious to, to a lot of folks, but important to note that it's, you know, it's a term that starts off within the Latinx LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and, and it's, you know, it is very much, I would say, a, an example of the idea of using language and self-identity um, and, you know, and terminology of like this. Um, as a means of pushing back against uh, patriarchy, as a means of pay pushing back against um, male dominance within society and also within language, right? Um, and so I I didn't put anything on the other two because I really um, I wanted to put them there because of um, because I they're, they're terms I see around. They, they, to me, they'll really represent just, again, kind of variations in, in essentially spelling and the way we're pronouncing things, right? But so that, that Chican X with an X on both ends is, um, is, again, I think embracing some of those same ideas that we see why Latinx became a thing. Um, people start putting the X at the other end of it, too, to embrace both kind of like the X at the beginning to embrace indigeneity and being native and that aspect of things, and then the X at the end to represent this idea of inclus inclusivity, really, um, and neutrality. And, and then the last variations, the most recent ones that I've seen and, and heard of are, are the idea of, of Latine or Latin being used instead of Latinx. And, and my sense of it is that it has a lot to do with just even pronunciation and the idea that, that, there's, that Latinx is kind of an awkward word within Spanish and that Spanish speakers who, who are, I, you know, um, liking the new 21st century terminology and identifying with it have kind of given us in a sense this very these more recent variations um latine because again an ending with an e on it like that isn't isn't masculine nor feminine within spanish or the idea of just latin um without without any ending right um and so I just wanted to i think i'm going to end there in terms of again giving us the history and evolution piece and Again, I really look forward to um, talking more about it all. And I wanted to see also, I mean, particularly, uh, Victoria, if, if you had something to add in on this, these last, this last slide, just in terms of the, you know, the, the 21st century piece of it. 
Um, and Matt, we did have a question. Yeah. Because Spanish is a gendered language, as are other Latin-based languages, what does this mean? What does this, what does this move towards using X mean for those languages? Or does it mean, is it going to mean anything? Um, that's a, a fair question, right? It's, you know, the whole, as you said, the whole language, and it's not just Spanish, it is other Romance languages, other Latin based languages, French and Italian, and right. Um, there are, there are many languages that are gendered in that way. And everything is either la or el, right? It's, um, and so, right. Um, I would say that, you know, the, the biggest, there, there are two huge sources I've seen of pushback against Latinx. And one of them has to do with um, you know, um, not embracing the idea of gender neutrality or people who might be trans or people who might like one aspect of pushback against Latinx is not not liking the politics that go along with it in terms of like gender and sexuality. Um, another aspect of people who don't like it might have nothing to do with that piece, but they're Spanish speakers from Latin America who say this term was invented by by americans basically like within the united states and they're trying to like tell us how to speak spanish now like what they're changing they're trying to change our whole language like that's not how it works and and again so there's i, I mean i think it's important to like share share that pushback in a sense right and again maybe the first one might be more familiar to folks the idea of people whose belief systems right say like i don't like this idea of of neutrality or 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 somebody being able to be gender neutral or right like so there's that piece i think that might be again more more familiar and and yet again there are um people within latin america who are spanish speakers who have really uh, expressed their dislike for for this term yet again my sense of it is that the the last two latine and latin are kind of interventions coming from the spanish speaking world um that are you know to, i don't know so it i don't know it's a great question though uh, and and i'd love to hear victoria's response to that as well as the question i initially asked too i think so. um there's a third component there as well of just yeah. um some folks who like we all know we get stuck in our ways um for particular reasons and so i would say that there's folks who are spanish speakers and non-spanish speakers who are here in the states who just think that this disruption is uncomfortable and they don't want it. Like they just are like, that's not how you speak. Uh, that's not a word. Why do you make up things, right? Um, and so I would say that there's a whole group of those folks as well. Um, and <clears throat> one of the things that I realized when you were chat, um, talking and presenting, Matt, is like this idea of gender neutrality is um, like a softer way of making sure that folks can uh, swallow what the X means, because it's about gender inclusion. It's actually not about neutrality, right? Um, and it's like, it, it is it is saying something. There is a political implication. There is a desire to disrupt, right? How gender has been asserted, even in our language. Um, and so I think that like, in many ways, I also was like, oh, this is a great gender, like neutral term. And then as I like used it, and even when I use it here in the Valley um, <clears throat> in class with folks, either there's still a resistance to um, even that language about gender neutrality, right? It's like, oh, well, how do you just be like neutral? And I'm like, I'm actually not being neutral. It's actually very much about inclusion. It's a kind of asserting that in a way. Um, and some folks just really are like, nope that's my language, or this is how I talk, this is what I do, I don't need to change in this way. Um, but I I like to encourage folks to kind of just sit with it and try it out, especially in class, right? Um, and see how it feels, because I think sometimes we just kind of get stuck <laughs> in rules that we've been socialized to believe are true, when in reality, we also created those rules too. Um, so we can uncreate them if we want. Yeah, I love I love the way you frame that desire to disrupt, right? I mean, it's like it is a it is that's why it's there is to to bring to start a conversation, right? And and to me, it's there's something very similar um, as we think about that term, even though the origins are different. Um, comparing it to the idea of Chicana Chicano in the 1960s, mm -hmm. right, is like to embrace that to say you were that 
might, might, your parents might be like, what are you talking about? Why do you say that? Right? Mm -hmm. Why are you saying that and not saying you're Mexican like I told you to say, right? And so, um, yeah, anyway, I just, I, 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 um, I think that's, that's useful. And I appreciate the, the, um, the difference there between neutrality and inclusion. And I, uh, yeah, appreciate that. And I would say this idea of uh, disrupting kind of roles as is, is like a key history and like cultural element of Chicanx people. <laughs> like that's been a huge part of, right? Like we're not, um, we don't fit this black white binary that was America as far as race conversations with. We can, we're not even talking about the fact that that binary doesn't address the fact that the genocide of indigenous peoples is really like the grounding of our country. So uh, we disrupt that by literally being, as you highlighted for us, like this whole different kind of a people. And at the same time, like every kind of decade generation, there's all these moments of disruption that I think in many ways, communities like Mexican Americans have been a part of like actively being involved in. And so I think it's a really uh, quite beautiful thing to see it happening again, even with our language, right? Um, in very like subtle, but important ways. Um, I will say that the term Latinx is definitely uncomfortable for lots of folks. Like, you know, I get to teach CLS, but like my mom is like, what? Or like, what is that? Or like, how do you say it? <laughs> um, am I using it right? Like, and so I think that it's 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 a it's a concern. It's something that's new, and hopefully, um, as folks continue to experience it and see if it works for them, then then folks will be able to kind of sit with that discomfort and actually sit with what it's implying um, about being more um, inclusive when it comes to ideas of our culture and our communities. Awesome. I I think that's that's the end of my piece. Just to be clear, Victoria, because you're in, you're in charge over there. Um, yeah. Oh, so, just so, yeah. so we just did a couple of slides on current issues um, and it was this is not all inclusive or we wouldn't have a reason to teach a <laughs> discipline <laughs> called Chicanx Latinx Studies. Um, these are just some issues that emerge uh, and I think they're common when you look at um, either editorials or sections on like Latino issues in America or NPR and like right all these kinds of different spaces uh, even local news um, and so uh, I think one thing to highlight is that um, most of these issues are going to be spoken about not from a deficit perspective. Um, most of the time, mainstream media kind of perpetuates very stigmatized um, ideas of what it means to be Hispanic, Latino, Latinx. Um, and this is more about kind of naming um yes, what that external lens has portrayed, but also what internal issues are happening within communities. And so Matt, feel free to just hop on and um, comments on anything um, here. So a key issue uh, that often comes up is language, right? Um, I don't know how many times I could reference the Selena movie and <laughs> where Selena's like needs to practice her Spanish because it's just not good enough and her dad's concerned that she's going to be ridiculed in Mexico. And, and then, you know, she goes through this interview and she can't remember the word excited in Spanish. So she says it in English and she's like, I know I'm going to get like totally torn apart for messing this up. Right. But language is a central element of culture, ethnicity and identity for Latinx, Chicanx folks. Um, and there is a tension that really exists, I think, for folks to feel like they belong culturally to a Chicanx community that's tied to language. Um, and there's tons of research that shows that if you don't know Spanish, that your feelings of belonging, even in your family, are less than those of you who do know Spanish, especially if that's a language that's spoken more often in your immediate community. Um, and so I think it's just important to acknowledge that that's still true um, about you, Matt. But I see it every day in class when people are just like, yeah, but like I get made fun of because I don't know Spanish, right? Um, which starts a whole conversation about okay, well, let's talk about like privilege because there's also other elements of your identity that you get benefits from and things of that sort. Um, but language is deeply political. Um, as much as we don't like to say it is, it is. Um, and we see that particularly bilingual education programs, right? Um, a lot of really strong bilingual education programs across the state 
target non-native speakers when they teach Spanish, right? There's not necessarily an investment in helping native speakers retain and use their language. Um, and so as somebody who just moved from Arizona and but is originally from Fresno, very different worlds, very different politics and policies around bilingual education. Um, Matt, did you want to add anything? I was just, yeah, I think that that's, it's a fascinating piece. Both my parents were bilingual educators um, within the framework of bilingual ed as as an embracing of native speakers and their culture and their language and, and communities. Um, and so I was very aware of the that transition taking place where, I mean, we as a state outlawed it in the 1990s, right? Proposition 227 um, ended that version of bilingual ed that comes out of civil rights movements that comes out of 1968. Um, and, um, and so as that version ended, right, we, there were, at first just a few examples of and now there are many of dual immersion programs which is a just it's, it's a different model um and again it's a it's a whole um it's about enrichment the um and uh, anyway so yes yeah, so i just uh, that piece in particular that uh, you, that you shared just struck a chord for me just as somebody who's you know um, again grew up and very aware of it in that in that sense um i would say also though the language piece for me is um in the classroom so often tied to identity where a lot of students i feel like have have this sense of these terms having um uh, being i guess defined by language i've heard so very many times the idea that so a chicano is like a mexican american but who doesn't speak spanish right like that's what a chicano is and like well it could be sure but that's not you know, Chicanos also do speak Spanish. Chicanas also do speak Spanish, right? And so um, a lot of times there's that sense of, of identity being tied up with language. And again, we, as you see with the idea of Hispanic, right, it is in that, that more broader historical sense. But none of those terms that I shared with you and none of the definitions had to do with whether you speak Spanish or not, right? None of them had to do with that. Although, again, for students very often and for young people, it's often like so... I can't really call myself that because I do or don't speak Spanish, right? And and so anyway, I just I, I thought that piece might be a, yeah. an interesting um, aspect to add. It in. becomes a test sometimes, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. And I think in my class, one of the things I like to tell folks is like, I am not about to correct how you pronounce <laughs> anything in this class of because like we all in many ways have been warped to pronounce and move our tongues and engage and do things in particular ways that are not like natural to us or our ancestors. So like, I'm not here to, you know, like be the police of language because um, it's a huge sensitive area for so many folks um, because, you know, you can get made fun of within your own family for saying something the wrong way, but then you can go to school and say it with an accent and then you also get made fun of. And so there's all these kind of different elements of language that are deeply impacting, I think, identity. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw one more piece that you just made me think of, and that's the idea of how we use, again, how we use language in the classroom, right? Because for me, my experience of Chicano studies classes um, in, as an undergrad, especially in at Fresno State in the late 1990s, um, was one where Chicano studies spaces, like the instructors, the professors would use Spanish and you were expected to know it. And those students who didn't felt left out, right? And like, and and there was a way in which I guess I, I, um, I as you were saying, it made me think of the fact that like, I, I and I know you are, the way you we frame these things within the classroom environment is like, I, I do include Spanish all, all the time but I'm always making sure to translate it because I'm not going to assume that the, that everybody here knows Spanish just because 98% of them are Mexican American or of Mexican descent. Um, and so in terms of just the way, I don't know, that, that was just another piece I just thought of and uh, if anyone wanted to add in, but thinking about um, generationally also how like the approach shifts within our, our discipline even, right? Yeah. Because for me, it was very much like, a, oh no, you're expected to know Spanish. And I, I mean, again, I did, but I could, you know, look around and sense the, you know, the people who didn't or and yeah. the way people would feel left out in that space. If, you know, you're in Chicano studies, you're going to you, you should know this. Right. Like that was kind of the assumption. So anyway. Yeah, I was one of those kids who 
probably felt left out. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I also was like always looking up words because I was like, uh, this discomfort is good for me, right? Like there's something also to learn from that. <laughs> um, but yes, we can always figure out ways to do it and then ways that include more folks, right? Um, education is another key one. And um, Matt knows I could talk about this forever and we only have four minutes. So we're not talking about any of this forever <laughs> um, because this is like my bread and butter, my pita butter and jelly, as I tell my little one. Um, <laughs> I look at the intersections of Chicanx students and education. Um, and these are just some of the issues that come up, right? So Chicanx, Latinx studies, broadly speaking, ethnic studies are now required courses in CSU systems which is exciting because that means we actually will talk about race and ethnicity, right? And all the possibilities that come connected to that social identity. Um, the outlawing of Mexican-American studies in Arizona has been a key issue because where you have California systems wanting to normalize ethnic studies as a discipline and as something that we need to learn. You have other states like Arizona saying it's anti-American, right? Um, then there's debates nationally, which I know you spoke to in another presentation around critical race theory, which has the debate has actually nothing to do with critical race theory itself because people are misinterpreting a lot of what critical race theory actually is. Um, and then you have things that are like within community that are important, which is educational attainment rates along the pipeline, right? Um, some folks have never been exposed to the idea of the um, the education to prison pipeline and what that has meant, but that's a true reality for a lot of our Latinx, Chicanx youth. Um, and also attainment rates, meaning graduations from college and universities and things of those side, things of those. Um, family involvement also is a key issue explored in education um, and not just family involvement, but how do we create culturally responsive school climates for families to be involved, right? Um, and then um, here are just some other kind of key pieces around immigration and gender. Um, we can talk a long time about citizenship and what does that actually mean, right? Um, but the reality is, is that children are being separated from their family at the border and they're being detained. And detainment is not a hotel, it's imprisonment. Um, and that's all happening, right? And then you have issues of immigration intersecting with Education, which is DACA, thankfully there's AB 540 in California, but in Arizona, there is nothing like AB 540, right? Um, so no state or federal aid can be used to support folks who have DACA. Um, so education in California is a really interesting dynamic for students who have DACA. Then you have gender, and um, we could talk about this for a long time too, but uh, patriarchy patriarchy's influence on dominant and even within Chicanx communities, like language we talked about, right? Um, but there's so many other ways that we could um, discuss and unpack gender. And do these things matter to the Latinx identity? Ultimately, they all do. Right? They're a key part of how we live, how we decide who we are. Yeah. Matt, any last thoughts? You know, mine. I'm. I'm just going to share again that, like, I just. I'm excited to to um, have Victoria on board within CLS and within our our, our department um, in general, but also just to, to collaborate to do stuff like this where we get opportunities to kind of think about stuff we already do, but think about it in a new way. Um, and and again to collaborate with and talk to have conversations with folks on our campus and and in our district. Um, and so I just, I'm, you know, I'm uh, again really thankful. Um, for the opportunity to do the collaboration to Susie and Eileen and everybody else in Classified Senate for um, helping us, for making it happen. So that's all. Yes. Thank you so much, Victoria and Matt. We appreciate the gift of your time and your energy and your passion to bring this to our classified professionals. We're immensely grateful for your participation in this series. Thank you to our interpreters, Chelsea and Javier. Finally, gratitude to you, our audience, for giving us an hour and a half of your Friday afternoon. You'll notice in the attendee hub that popped up, evaluations for the seminar are available for you. Please fill those out. The only way we can improve is if you tell us how we're doing, what we're doing great, and what we need to work on. We hope you join us for our next seminar on anti-Asian violence and Asian American identity on April 29th. 
Thank you all. Goodbye. We hope you have a fabulous weekend.